so much. Um, right, so our next speaker is Dr. Um, Sunny Collings, um, who's just jetted back from overseas, uh, where she's been attending a, a conference in Glasgow, is that right, Sunny? And Sunny is, a, is the co-director um, for the Social Psychiatry and Population Mental Health Research Unit at the University of Otago. And Sunny's going to be talking about the person at risk um, clinical portraits. Kia ora. Um, I'd just like to address Paul really briefly. He uh, started by asking how many journalists were in the audience because he wanted to identify the number of friends he had <laughs> in the audience. And I just wanted to um, reflect back to him that some of your friends might not be journalists. And I've always, and joy might not be quite the right word, but. Um, in a professional sense, I have um, perhaps been very fortunate um, to have only had positive experiences working with journalists uh, in relation to media reporting of suicide. And so I have personally felt um, quite a warm and positive sort of ongoing relationship. So I hope you might count me and some other people <laughs> like me as potential friends. <laughs> um, I'm going to be telling some uh, personal stories, uh, not, not about me, except my involvement as a clinician. Um, they're going to bring home, in quite an immediate way, some of the messages that we've already heard this morning. Um, they have been heavily disguised, but they are real stories about real people, and they obviously have an impact um, that's lasting for the people they left behind. And so I would just ask if people can think about these stories and consider them in a professional way, as I'm sure you all will, um, and just, just be thoughtful about any conversations you might have about this material outside this room, uh, just out of respect um, for, for the content, really. Um, OK. I'm going to tell you a few stories, and then I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the common elements, because being the last speaker, some of, some of the things that I was going to say have already been uh, said, so I'll just launch right into it. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to tell you about Carly, not her real name, and this was a long time ago now, and, and not in New Zealand, actually. Carly was 27 years old. She had a professional job, and she had um, a, a history of depressive illness, and she'd had two major episodes and had been hospitalised for both of those episodes. She also had a strong family history of depression. And her father had made a serious suicide attempt using a very violent method when she was around 16. So she had a good knowledge of that. It wasn't as if she was too young to remember. She, she, knew, she knew what had happened and she knew about the, the impact on, on other people. So she uh, presented with a new episode of depression and she was faced with significant time off work due to this, which was um, a huge issue for her. Uh, her job, um, she was good at her job and her job was a very important part of her sense of self-worth and identity, as it probably is for, for almost everybody in this room. Her treatment didn't work as well as it had in the past. And after some um, months, about three or so months of this treatment really not working as um, everybody had hoped, she died by a violent method which was different to the method that her father had used. She left behind some diaries um, which her family shared with the clinicians who'd been involved. And these diaries revealed an increasing preoccupation with the po possibility of dying by suicide, actually from the time of her second depressive episode. So this had been in her thoughts for quite a long time. And the preoccupation was further revealed and uh, emphasised really by um, both the details of diary contents and also a collection of newspaper and magazine articles about people who died by suicide that she had collected over quite a long period of time. And some, importantly, I think, 
some of these had, had been collected while she was not depressed. So this had been in her head um, for, for a very long period. And I've just got a couple of examples of um, diary entries here. She said at one point, it's hard not to think of this as a way of avoiding the future. The thought comes to me and then I feel a sense of relief. And another entry quite a lot later, been reading the clippings, others do this, maybe it's inevitable, the world moves on. And there are two key things I think about these entry, entries that a clinical perspective helps um, elucidate a bit more. Um, firstly, um, when she was clinically depressed, Carly couldn't help seeing suicide as an option. She didn't have access to her usual wide range of coping strategies that she had access to when she wasn't depressed. Her future seemed bleak, that is the nature of depressive illness, and she felt relief when she thought she didn't have to face her bleak future. So she was very psychologically tuned into the idea of suicide, and she obviously would have been quite sensitised to this um, because of uh, the, what happened to her father. And we, we know that a family history of suicide increases a person's risk anyway. And I should also say that the father's suicide attempt was very serious. It was life-threatening, and it was just luck that he was found. He was very ill when he was found. Wondering, we, we found ourselves wondering, and this is speculation, and clinicians speculate a lot because you've only got data about, you know, and information about one a single person, but we, we speculated um, about, the, you know, the collection of the cuttings when she wasn't depressed and wondered if maybe it was part of her way of trying to understand what had happened with her father as well. So, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's not a simple sort of linear thing. It's a complicated thing that... that um, she is she experienced and the second entry shows in a sense that she somehow sees a sort of validation in what she finds in the articles and there's a kind of resignation as well as a denial I think of the impact on others remarkably despite her experience with her dad so what's she doing um, oh actually the other thing I was going to mention is another clipping that I haven't put on here um, mentioned method, only one of the clippings mentioned method, and that was the method that she used, and it was a violent method. What's she doing with all this? Um, we think she, we thought she was trying to make sense of her experience, which is what we all do, of course, and she's trying to problem solve. But we did wonder at the time, and you know, with the accumulated evidence since then, the, you know, that Jane's talked about, and this case was quite a long time ago now. Perhaps the availability of this kind of material tipped the balance for her at a time when she was particularly vulnerable in combination with her illness um, so that she ended up taking her own life. And I would just like to acknowledge um, Carly's family who a long time ago now gave me permission to tell her story in a case report that was part of my training and also to use it in teaching, which is the way that I'm framing this event in my mind. Daniel. Daniel was 19, he was a studious, intelligent um, boy with, uh, from a Jewish background, very strong Jewish faith, um, middle class background. He had a gradual onset psychotic illness um, that was um, very, very prominently flavoured by persecutory religious themes and he believed, he came to believe that he would be martyred. He was very, very fearful of this, but he came to believe that this was his destiny and he came to believe that the way he would be martyred would be revealed by God to him. As his illness progressed, he became more and more preoccupied with um, religious themes, and uh, this developed over many, many months, and I should say that um, this was out of context of his normal religious belief and practice, and we got um, advice about this from a very uh, senior rabbi who was closely involved in the case for uh, pretty much over the whole time. Uh, he came to believe he would be martyred by a specific violent method, so it was his, his thinking was becoming more narrow, more constrained, uh, and that the date would be revealed to him. Um, he believed that it would be re revealed to him through religious texts, um, the, the method, but the date would be re re revealed through the television. So there's, there's, there's complexity and specificity developing as his illness progresses. 
His behaviour became very disorganised so that he couldn't plan and execute even quite simple goals. Uh, oh, and I should, um, oh, I'll mention, I, I won't, I'll just do stick to the order I've got here. Um, the tre his treatment began to have some effect and we thought that the thoughts of martyrdom had receded and, and certainly his behaviour, his capacity to manage his behaviour and behave in a goal-directed way was certainly restored to a large extent. And he made moderate progress over a two to three month period. He still thought martyrdom was a possibility, although it wasn't, it wasn't a strong or um, fixed belief. And I should say this was before religious martyrdom was commonly discussed in the media, you know, as it has been over the last, um, I don't know, seven, eight years. There were some newspaper and TV reports of a workman dying from uh, accidental electrocution um, when working on an electrical transformer in a public place. And despite the fact that he'd been seemingly getting better, the following week, Daniel tried to kill himself using a very similar, although more dangerous, method to that had been reported, and he was severely burnt. He became very, very psychotic, believed that he had failed God, and he began to engage in various acts of very, very driven self-punishment, um, which weren't designed to kill him, they were designed to punish him, so very, very unpleasant. And then he later died of suicide, um, not that long after this, by his original violent method, which we had known what that was, um, while he was still in hospital, in fact. Um, actually, I'll just go back. Um, a key aspect of um, Daniel's story, again, was that his thinking was really distorted and he was extremely ill. And the normal range of his thinking was very, very limited. Uh, his suicidal thinking was part of a system of abnormal false beliefs. Uh, he was still clearly very vulnerable to suggestion, even though we thought he was getting better. Uh, he, had a, he had a particular motive which was different to Carly's motive, I suppose is what I'm, what I'm trying to say, but the characteristics of his thinking had similarities. Uh, his, cho his first choice of method was very unusual, and it's very hard to imagine that it wasn't associated with the report, which the media report wasn't a report of a suicide, it was an accidental death, but it's, it's hard to imagine that the two were unconnected. Um, and I would just like to acknowledge Daniel, um, who um, has stayed with me actually over many years, and he gave me a very important lesson about the nature of suffering. This is a different story, completely different. This is Tamsin, and um, Tamsin is alive. Uh, but it, it, makes a, it makes a similar point, but in a different kind of way. Tamsin's 30, well, at this, this time that this uh, events happened, she was 39, and has a history of borderline personality disorder, which is um, a disorder characterized by extreme and disabling difficulties regulating affect or emotional states. And she had engaged in acts of repeated deliberate self-harm over many years by cutting and burning herself. And she had very slowly responded to treatment and learnt to manage um, herself uh, much more effectively and less self-destructively, uh, so that her episodes of self-harm had diminished in frequency to only a few times a year and only by one method, which was burning. And she stayed this, at this level for um, a couple of years then she read a magazine article about deliberate self-harm by cutting, uh, and the article discussed a range of reasons for people engaging in deliberate self-harm, and within several weeks of reading this article, which she kept, she began cutting herself again. Um, we couldn't identify any other sort of stress, stressor um, that had come up that might have you know, prompted this, um, it was really quite a, a puzzle to us, but when we talked about it with her, what was pretty clear was that she identified with, with the stories of some of the people in the article, and, you know, there were similarities. Um, she kept the article as a sort of self-validation in case she ever sort of slipped back. That was why she, that was her intention when she kept it in the first instance. 
Um, just another example, perhaps, of how the media might get under the skin. So what are the key elements of these stories? Well, case reports, which is what these are effectively, are not a very strong kind of evidence. Um, fair enough. You can't argue a simple sort of linear causality from this kind of story. But we've heard this morning of some powerful evidence at um, population levels. And, uh, you know, in the Keith Horton study that we heard a little bit about, he did get some, some clinical accounts that were consistent with the population level data. And, I, and I've shared with you this morning some clinical accounts that I think are also consistent with that. So these sorts of accounts do add individual level plausibility to existing evidence. All these people were psychologically, psychologically vulnerable at the time, and all the cases were complex. So it's not, you know, it's not simple, and I think the other speakers have all acknowledged that these links between media influences and suicide are never going to be simple. But we did feel that in two of, um, well, I've, in two of these um, three cases, uh, there probably are links with method. Um, the method being described. I haven't proposed any mechanisms as, as to how this might get under the skin, and of course I've limited my um, presentation to print media, but the, these effects are not limited to print media. Um, they, they are just the stories that I had that I could share with you. So thank you very much and I hope it's been helpful.